Good morning. I'd like to begin by welcoming all our guests. We would ask if you stick around right after services, give us a chance to get to know a little bit better. Also, if you would, fill out a card in the back of the pew and hand it to one of the men on your way out of the auditorium this morning. As a reminder, please to take this time to silence any electronic devices to keep it from interrupting our services. Uh, some prayers to, keep, uh, to remind everybody on is the evangelistic efforts. Uh, if you would visit the board up on, out here at the left, we'll keep you up to date on all the events that are going on currently across the uh, that we support, as well as our missionaries, the Southwest and Southeast students. And just keep in mind also our prayer list: Sherry Ackhoff, uh, Hope Tyler, Jeff, and Jess Elam are both combating COVID at this time, and also the Hernandez family. Uh, on the back board back there is a sign-up sheet for the next fellowship meal, so if you would sign up so I uh, can figure out what everybody's doing for that. And I want an update on Aiden and Karen's daughter Raquel. She is improving. Uh, they are currently keeping themselves in kind of a self-imposed quarantine because Raquel's still in the NICU unit. Uh, but she is doing better, the mom's doing better, and uh, Aiden is continuing to do his studies online right now to keep up uh, with what he's going through. So let's keep them in our prayers. Be thankful for the what's going on and the improvements, uh, but they still get some more to do. If you'll pray with me, uh, we'll go into our morning worship hour. Our Father in heaven, we come to you now at this time to thank you for the day, to thank you for the church that is here, for the opportunity to gather here with these fellow Christians, to sing these songs to your praises, to come to you with prayer, and to take an opportunity to learn about you more, the will and the word that you've given us. We thank you this time for Brother Rig, for the songs that he's prepared to lead us in this morning. We pray that what we do is worship to you. Thank you for Cody, for the time and effort and the life that he's dedicated to studying your word, that he can bring this to us, that we have a better understanding. We pray this time that we'll take what we've listened to and what we hear here today. We take it, we study it, we continue to meditate upon it, and to live it out in our everyday lives, that through our speech and our behavior, Bring examples to those in the world that uh, can bring others to you. Pray this time it should be with those that have chosen not to be here, that have decided something that is more important than uh, being here with a fellow Christians to worship you, that we can continually pray with them, to worship, to study with them, and to convince them to join us here once again. We pray always for those that are sick and that are unable to join us because of that. We will be with them, give them the health and comfort that you can. That you be with the doctors who tend to their needs at this time, that you will give them the, the strength and knowledge you can to help them find the best, best path to recovery. We thank you this time for Aiden and Raquel for the strength and the effort that you've given them, for the continuing health of them at this time. We pray you'll continually be with them and be with those who are tending to the daughter at this time to give them the best recovery possible. We thank you this time always for the elders that are overseeing this church. We pray that you continually be with them and the strength that we Pray to also be with us in the congregation to continue to encourage them and to give them the help and the support that they need to keep this church on the straight and righteous path. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> well, I encourage you to take a song book. Please turn to number 260. 260. Time. 
Let's pray, please. Dear Father, we come before you at this time. Pray that you will continue to be with us as we go with this service. Pray that you be with Rig and help him to recall things he studied and there's a lined up for us to sing. And thank you for him having the ability to lead us in, in the way that he does. Pray that you continue to be with this congregation and help us to always look to you for the strength and guidance and wisdom that we need through your word and not ourselves. Dear Father, pray that you be with our sick and be with those that are taking care of them, the doctors and nurses and caregivers. Pray that if it is your will, that they'll have a speedy recovery and once again rejoin us. Pray that you continue to be with our missionaries and, and the preaching schools, both southeast and the southwest. Pray that you continue to be with Cody as he works here with us. For these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please mark 447. 447. That will be the song of encouragement after Cody's lesson. And if you mark that, a few pages back, we'll see number 442. 442. Let's be standing for the song, please. 442.
Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible reminds us that it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Each and every one of us is headed towards death. That's one of the things in life you can hang your hat upon. And each one of us, as we head that direction toward death, ought to be mindful of the fact that there is a judgment that follows that. Concerning what the Bible teaches, uh, as far as the judgment, there, there are some things to consider here. First, it's that the judgment is clear. It is going to happen. Second, you consider how it is, or who it is, uh, or rather how it is we will be judged. It tells us in John chapter 12 and verse 48, he says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. We're to be judged by the word of God. We know also whom we will be judged by. In Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and 31, it tells us the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world by righteous, or judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he gives assurance of all things uh, by raising him from the dead. And this is speaking of the righteous judge, which Paul spoke of in 1 Timothy 4, in verses 7 to 8, as one who rewards those who do works of righteousness. And this, of course, will be the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. These are all things that the Bible brings to our minds uh, concerning judgment. These are heavenly reminders, if you will, that such a day is out there, such a day is approaching, and such a day awaits us. There is a, a standard by which we're going to be judged, as well as not only being judged by a perfect standard, we're going to be judged by a perfect being who's going to carry out the perfect judgment. All of these are details that are important, but they're not the details that consume the whole of the matter. We must also consider, as we think about the judgment day, uh, what it is that we will be judged over. We know how, we know by whom, we know uh, when. How is it, or what is it, in our lives that is going to be held under consideration by God on that day? The Bible, as we look at it, teaches us three different areas of our lives that are going to be held under consideration on that day. How will we be judged? If you look at me in Revelation 20 and look at verses 11 through 15, you're going to see here first that we will be judged by our works. We will be judged by our works. We look here in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. This is an end time context. This is Jesus speaking, or this is the Holy Spirit providing John the utterance concerning the last moment. This is the judgment day. It says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and there was no, and there, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. As we look at Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, looking at it and what it teaches us concerning the judgment of our works, we see first that we are going to be judged concerning our works, which is something we speak on further that many people would rather us deny. And it's not going to just be a judgment of my works, not going to just be a judgment of your works. And there's not going to be people who are going to escape the judgment of their works. The text tells us that both great and small are going to appear before this throne. The idea there is that all men are going to appear before this throne and be judged according to all things 
which they had done. And in this judgment, we're going to see different books open. These different books provide the standard and the perfection of that judgment. One book that's going to be opened, and we know this because of John chapter 12, is the word of God. John 12 verse 48, which we mentioned already in this lesson. And then another book that's going to be opened is going to be a book, we could call it the book of deeds. This is going to have everything in it that we have done. This in the Bible is going to be held in consideration against us along with the book of life. The book of life is a reference to a book that, can, that contains the names of those who have put on their Lord. Those who have made themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. And so in that book alone, we could say there is a judgment being pronounced there, or at least a partial judgment being pronounced there, whether or not you have found yourself to be a believer of Jesus Christ. But then in the other two books, that's whenever you're going to find what you have done being viewed in consideration, placed on the balancing scales with the word of God. And the only way that you're going to receive life eternal is if that balance is justified. That's the only way. Now, many treat the judgment of God as if it's a new thing, and many treat, treat it as a strange thing. But by no means is the judgment day of God a strange thing or a new thing. If you look with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon spoke of this as a thing which the people knew. In Ecclesiastes 12, in verses 13 and 14, Solomon or the preacher, as he calls himself in this book. He's finishing this sermon, if you will, where he has gone through and he's talked about all the vain things he's pursued in life. And all those mistakes, really, that were caused by implication of pursuing these things. He talks about this and he wraps up his sermon there in verse 13 in familiar terms. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Everything's going to be held under consideration. Jesus spoke of this. Jesus laid down the, the uh, expectation as well there in the New Testament, John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. He said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Everyone is going to be judged, again, Christ saying this, according to their works. According to their works. And it's every man is going to be judged. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 tells us that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive judgment according to things done in the body, whether good or evil. And Romans chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11, Paul is speaking about the sins of the Jews. He already talked about the sins of the Gentiles in chapter 1, and he talked about how they received judgment according to what they had done. And speaking in Romans 2, he's having to approach those who had a long-standing religious uh, connection with, Christ, or with, with God, or, or one which they considered to be greater than what the Gentiles had. And he talks to them and puts it in, in certain terms so that they would understand, hey, even you, I know you think you're not going to receive a judgment. I know you think you're already good because of who you are. It boils down, Romans 2, verses 5 through 11, to what you do. What you do matters on the day of judgment. Your works matter as it pertains to eternal life or eternal damnation. Now, of course, this point has to be belabored because so many in the religious world today want to tell us that our works don't matter. And they try to take the approach of Satan and twist Scripture. They use Ephesians chapter 2, and verses 8 and 9 in, in, their, uh, in their rebuttal. If you look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it tells us there, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
So they, these are people who say it's by faith alone, it's by grace alone, which even that alone tells you that it's neither one of those alone, but yet they have seven alone statements that saves man, apparently. So, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. Many people are going to use this as a uh, justification, if you will, for teaching a faith alone salvation. There's a clear mistake that takes place with this. Obviously, I disagree with the fact that of saying that works is the exclusive, uh, the exclusive source of our salvation. Jesus would disagree with that in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 24, talking about those who are going to come up to him on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and cast out demons in your name? And he's going to look at those individuals and say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Wait a second, those are works of righteousness. you got to think about what's missing here. You, work, you workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. So it's not the works alone, but the works are inclusive. Because if you look there in Matthew 7 and verse 21, it talks about those inheriting heaven, those who have done the will of God. The will of God is carried out by the works of man. That's how such a thing is carried out. So works have a part in your salvation. And the irony of this is that the people who again tell you, works have no part in your salvation are the people that tell you you are saved by faith alone. Is there an inconsistency with that? Look at John chapter 6 verses 28 and 29. John chapter 6 verses 28 and 29. Jesus has been spending time with, with the Jews. He had just previously fed 5,000. He's walked upon the water. People are following him. And here he comes. He's telling them that he's the bread of life. And people want to know, how do, how do I get eternal life? I know you can offer this bread. How do I get eternal life? Tell me how to do that. What must I do? Look there in verse 28. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. What is that? Faith? Well, people tell us it's faith alone that saves you and not works. The works, that's not involved, but faith is a work. Think about another work that people negate its necessity for salvation. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is baptism. People say baptism doesn't save you because it's a work of man. First, that's incorrect. It's a work of God, Colossians 2 and verse 12. Second, as we think about what is necessary for salvation, think with me about uh, Psalm 15 and verses 1 and 2. David's question, Psalm 15 and verse 1. Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Who shall, who shall sojourn in your tent? What David is asking God in Psalm 15 and verse 1 is, Who is it that is going to be in heaven with you? Who is it that's going to have an eternal abode with you? Who is going to have eternal life? Who's going to have salvation? And if you look at verse 2, it tells us, He who works righteousness he who works righteousness do you think about that think about our study in the book of Matthew on Sunday mornings Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15 Jesus he goes to John to be baptized John says no way am I baptizing you you ought to be baptizing me what did Jesus say it must be done to fulfill all righteousness Baptism fulfills all righteousness. Baptism is a work of righteousness. Works of righteousness are necessary for an eternity in heaven. And then also consider this part here. Matt, um, 
Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48. Peter has been with the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit has fallen upon the Gentiles. They are approved by God to receive salvation. Peter, it tells us, commanded them, after having received the Holy Spirit, to be baptized. Commanded baptism. That's a work. It's a work that needs to be obeyed. It's a command of God. It is necessary for our salvation. So as we think about our works, on the day of judgment, each and every one of us, we're going to be judged according to our works. We will be judged on whether or not we have done works of faith. We have done works of righteousness. It tells us in Acts 10 and verse 35 that God is not partial in his judgment concerning man, but he looks, and this is my paraphrase here, he looks to judge those and give life to those who have done works of righteousness. That is what we're going to be judged upon. We will be judged upon whether or not we have been baptized. We, we, we will be judged upon whether or not we have believed. We will be judged about what we have done in life. And also we will be judged on what we have neglected from our life. If you look with me in Matthew 25 and verses 45 and uh, 46. Matthew 25 verses 45 and 46 context here, the final judgment. Verses 45 and 46, then he will answer saying, truly I say to you, in this context he said, I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was naked, you gave me no clothing. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was sick, you didn't, you didn't uh, heal me. Uh, you didn't minister to me. Verse 45, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. A lot of people want to justify themselves by what they have done. But it could be the change, or it, there is the possibility here you can jeopardize your salvation by what you do not do. If there are works of righteousness to carry out, and you turn away from it, eternal life is kind of hanging in the balance there. And the Word of God push, pushes that judgment towards eternal damnation. We will all be judged according to what we have done and what we have not done in our lives. Second this morning, we will be judged by our words. Look at me in Matthew 12 and verses 36 and 37. Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37. Jesus says here, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak, other translations, every idle word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus is speaking to those who have an issue with misusing their tongue. And if I know anything about myself, if I could assume anything and be right about yourself, is that we fall into the habit of times, at times, of misusing our tongue. And so Matthew 12, and verse 36 and 37 is just as pertinent to us as it was to those who Jesus was originally speaking it to. And as Jesus spoke to these individuals who had a problem of misusing their tongue, he spoke of two things. He spoke of number one, how our words will be under consideration and judgment. They will be used either to justify or to condemn us. And number two, that every word is going to be under consideration and judgment. The careless words, the idle words, these are the things that are going to be observed as well. And these are the things that people often think won't. Because if you think about a careless word, you think about an idle word, this is a word that's spoken in leisure. This is a word that, uh, this is talking without giving little thought, or with giving little thought to what you're talking about, giving little consideration, not much care involved in it. And this is speaking freely because you think you're in an intimate enough 
situation or setting to where you can say whatever's on your mind and no one's going to hold it against you. The irony of that, of course, is it's going to be held against you by the final judge. The eyes of the ones you cannot see. You think about what Jesus says about our words. There's a lot that Jesus says about our words. A lot which we talked about this morning. And I, we're going to brush over it again. Look with me at the Sermon on the Mount. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5. Specifically verse 22. Jesus talked to us about angry words. Matthew 5 and verse 22. He said, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to hellfire. What Jesus is talking about here is how we handle our emotions and, and show them forth in our speech. He acknowledges here, of course, a general temptation that each one of us have. And that is when we're angry with our brother, our temptation is to degrade them, to try to humiliate them, and to beat them down with our speech. He wants us... Um, he is warning us against a habit uh, and temptation by reminding us that there is a liability with these words that are spoken. There's a liability to the council. The greater and more uh, concerning than that is there's a liability of hellfire. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is, is we think about angry words. So angry words can and they will condemn you. Angry words are not justified. Look over here in Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37, talking about oaths here. Jesus talks about swearing, making oaths. He says, um, and again, you have heard it said, uh, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. Here again, people fell into the habit of being dishonest in their practices. And they would swear by things which they had no right, authority, or ability to wager. And so, it, really what Jesus is speaking about here is hypocrisy in our speech, namely hypocrisy in our transactions. And so, what he's saying here is just be honest. Look with me in Matthew 7, in verses uh, 1 through 4 here. Jesus talks about judging words. Judging words. You can notice verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That is a general warning, really, to judge with grace. Something people don't understand is that you have the bar of judgment here, right? Think about it, and maybe this isn't the best comparison, but think about it as uh, you're at Six Flags. All those roller coasters have a you must be this tall to ride sign. So you go to it, and this is the standard here, and here I am pronouncing judgment that is completely unnecessary. What I'm doing is I'm raising that bar, not for them, but for myself. And so me being unnecessarily harsh, going beyond the means of the word of God to pronounce judgment on whether or not that person has salvation, that is making it harder for me to get to heaven. And so Christ wants us to understand that. Christ wants us to be aware of that, that we ought to be judging with mercy. It tells us in James 2, verses uh, 12 and 13, So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Be merciful in your judgment. And so Jesus reminds us of that before he gets into the uh, scenario here. And the scenario is you have a man with a speck in his eye who is confronted by his brother who has a log in his own eye. And so Jesus, what he's trying to hit on here in verses 3 and 4 is the idea of being careful with your words because your words really are the finalization of the judgment you've already made. And it is, um, 
again, it makes you liable at receiving a harsher judgment in the end. Look with me in Ephesians 4 and Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 5. As we think about words, Ephesians chapter 4 marks a transition in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians can be split into two sections. Chapters 1 through 3 is the doctrinal section. It's how God looks at the church. It's the church's identity. And then uh, chapters 4 through 6 are the practical section. This is how the world sees. This is the church's actions. This is what, it, what real life Christianity looks like. And so in chapter 4 and verse 17, we're talking here about the new life. We're talking about the way in which we live now that we are in Christ. And part of that, part of the Christian living, is Christian speaking. You look there in verse 25 through 32 here, and consider what it says about our speech. Verse 25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So, put away falsehood. Put away your lying words. Continuing, verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. We think about anger. Put away angry words. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Verse 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. So put away corrupting speech. But only such is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So graceful words, add those to your vocabulary. Encouraging words, add those to your vocabulary. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Put away all evil speech. Put it all away. In verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Add mercy, add kindness, add forgiveness to your vocabulary. And if you continue there in chapter 5, chapter 5, here, here's a great transition. Chapter 5, we talked about it all January. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved Children, What we're talking about here relates to Christ-likeness, relates to godliness. And continuing in chapter 5, there's more said about our speech. Look there, chapter 5 and verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Put the filthy speech away. Use your tongue for something better. Thanksgiving glorifying God. Continuing on, you have verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Put away empty speech. I know he's saying, don't let anyone corrupt you with empty speech. Obviously, you can make the connection there. If I'm not to be corrupted by empty speech, I'm not supposed to speak empty speech. So you don't speak in such a way. Instead, you speak this way. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Pull back up. Verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but wise. So we're talking about wisdom here. Making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19. We already talked about it. How not to talk. This is how you talk. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord in, uh, with your heart. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You look at that. How is it that we are to talk? Instead of using crude speech. Instead of using filthy speech. Instead of using empty speech. <clears throat> use holy speech. Use edifying speech. That's how we are to talk. Of course, everyone wants to ask the question, does it really matter how we talk? Think about it. Think about what we talked about. Does it really matter what words I say carelessly? Yeah, because they can be the difference between God's heaven and the devil's hell for you. 
Does it really matter how I speak when I'm angry? Absolutely, those things are going to be held under consideration on the day of judgment. You're not going to receive a pass like we so often extend to ourselves and maybe to others of, oh, they were just angry. God's not going to do that. It's going to be right there in the book of deeds. What has he done? What has he said? The angry words are going to be there. They're going to be held in correlation to the word of God. And the judgment is going to be pronounced. Does it matter if I speak honest words? Think if Ananias and Sapphira were around to ask that question, they could give you a good, solid answer and say, yes, it matters that you're honest. Because it's not just about being honest with man. They were dishonest with man. It's about being honest with God. The honesty I extend to man is the honesty I extend to God because they lied to the face of the apostles. They lied to the face of the Christians. And yet it was the Holy Spirit that it tells in, in Acts chapter 5 whom they had lied to. So consider your honesty. And then does it really matter if I speak in uh, judging, in a judging way? Do I speak judging words? All I would say is in Matthew 18... Jesus gives a parable of the unmerciful servant, and it mattered for him. So the best thing to take away from that is that it matters for you. On the day of judgment, <clears throat> we're all going to be judged by the works that proceed from our mouths and the words which come from our mouth, or works that proceed from our hands and the words which proceed from our mouths, whether spoken with purpose or in passing. On the day of judgment, when we stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, when those three books are open, it isn't going to be a matter of who we are. My name isn't going to say, oh, you're Cody Kilburn? All right, man, you go in. Being a Christian is not going to save me. Oh, you're, you were baptized in uh, 2008? Yeah, man, come on in. That's not going to save me. What's going to save me is what works have I done? What speech have I had? And then what we want to talk about this evening is what have I done with what God has given me? We talked this morning, we are judged by our works and we are judged by our words. This evening we're going to talk about how we will be judged by our wealth. And that is going to be our consideration for this evening. But as we tie things up and put a bow on it this morning, as we talk about judgment, of course, is a scary thing. And of course, it's one of those things that even myself as a preacher, I, in preparation, I step on my toes every single, every single time, every single line. Whenever I'm in the pulpit, it's an awkward sermon to deliver because I'm talking about things I'm guilty of. Surely, these are things that we're all guilty of. Surely there are all different areas, perhaps, whether it's works or words, which we need to improve in life. And so my encouragement for you this morning is to make those improvements. Because as Acts 17 and verse 31 tells us, there is a day. And on that day, we are going to be judged by a righteous judge. And we're going to be given a judgment. You're either going to go to the left or you're going to go to the right. You're going to be with the sheep, you're going to be with the goats. You're going to have eternal, uh, eternal life. You're going to have eternal damnation. And you're going to have to swallow the pill, whichever it is, whether you're thankful or you're unthankful. You have to swallow the pill and recognize this is the right judgment. And so, in anticipation of the right judgment, prepare by right living. This morning, if there are any here who are in the Lord's church, and you feel the need to ask the congregation for prayers, to repent of any sin, and whatnot, we would love to help you with that. Also this morning, if there are any who are outside the Lord's church, what I mean by that is, have you believed in Jesus Christ? John 8 and verse 24. That's necessary for salvation. Have you been baptized? That's necessary for your salvation. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Mark 16 verses 15 and 16. Matthew 20, verses 18 through 20. Oh, those things are necessary. Have you repented of your sins? Luke 13 and verse 3, that's necessary. You've confessed Jesus Christ, that's necessary. All these things are necessary. If I just said something that you have not done, you are not inside of Christ. 
And so the encouragement this morning is to get inside of Christ. In Christ, you have the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. In Christ, you have the hope of eternal life. That's the very reason for which he came. I came, John 10 and verse 10, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That is a beautiful, beautiful gift that is extended to any single person who would desire to take it. And God wants you to take it. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 desires all men to be saved. Do you desire it as well? If you do, if you desire to put your Lord on in baptism, if you desire studies um, of, of what it means to be a Christian or how to become a Christian, we would love to help you with that. And we'd love to assist you in whatever way we could. Please, if you have a request, please make that known as together we stand and as we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar of high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of why. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be?
scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 6 and verses 53 through 56. It reads, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Never pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's Day, Father. Father, as our minds go back to that cross, Christ down for our sins, Father. Father, help us to take of this bread which Christ has his body. Help us to do it in remembrance of him. For us this bread, in Jesus' name, amen. heaven as we continue that thanks at this time for your son who came and died on that cross as we take of this cup and reflect on the blood that he shed for our sins and this we ask in Jesus name amen the Lord's Supper now an opportunity to return a portion to the Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings we receive each and every day, Father, our physical and spiritual. As we take this opportunity, Father, to return a portion of thee, 
We pray that we do so with an open and cheerful heart. Pray for the elders of this congregation, Father, that they will always use these funds to spread their word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing song will be number 512. 512. And then we'll have Dad lead our closing prayer. Let's be standing for this song, please. 512.